Okay, so I'm just going to give a little welcome, really, to talk about Liz. There's more good stuff coming, but I guess I wanted to talk about uh, the Liz I know, and many of you know her in many other ways. Um, I've, I've had the great pleasure of working with Liz since I arrived at the Polytechnic um, just over two and a half years ago, and I think that really she represents our value of Manakitaka, caring. She's a wonderful person, she's very caring, she gives a great deal to her community and has done for many years. Um, she's been somebody that's been absolutely crucial in our space of developing research, and particularly in the field of ethics. Um, that's been a key piece of work that Liz has graciously led for some time and has done a fantastic job. Um, not least when we know that the quality of our research, even by government standards, has raised significantly in the last round of the PBRF. So thank you, Liz. Um, Liz is also a multidisciplinarian, or a transdisciplinarian, and I'm sure she'll be able to explain her own views on that when she gives us her wonderful lecture. One of the key tenets, when I asked around, I said, you know, what would you say about Liz? Everybody said to me she's highly learner and student focused, so the people in her care are those that matter to her the most. So, you know, that's a, a pretty amazing disposition to have. She's also been a great leader for us in her many facets and the many roles that she's undertaken uh, with us here at the Polytechnic and within the broader community here in Dunedin and Otago, nationally, regionally and internationally as well. She is exceptionally kind. She is very flexible, uh, which you kind of have to be when you're looking after ethics for us, I think. Um, I found her to be exceptionally gentle and extremely thoughtful in her interactions with me personally and with the other people that we work together uh, in collaboration with. And most of all, I think she is a consummate professional who lives the values of OP, and we're very delighted to have you in our panel, um, Liz. So without any further ado, I will pass over to Ron, who's going to do a little welcome, and then we will lead into your lecture. So good luck, and thank you. Nati pō ko te ao, he re tagara, he re whenua ki te whae ao, ki te ao marama whānau, whānau, a haro mai te tōki, homi e, hui e, tā eki e. Um, so those words that I've just started off with, those, those small words talk about uh, um, daytime following night. Uh, so everything in the universe is in its place. Uh, and that people and the landscape are, are drawn together and held together as we are in this landscape here. And that when we are, it's our responsibility to move forward together graciously and accept the challenges that sit, be that sit before us. And when we do, to, to pick up and accept those challenges uh, together as one. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Una, for uh, inviting me up to do um, the introduction of, uh, well, for Liz. And when I was thinking about exactly what I was going to say, I wasn't exactly sure where I was going to go, so I thought I'd better take some, take some notes uh, because there's so much to talk about, but I thought with my time of knowing Liz uh, and, and the story that makes up her life to where she got here today, is a story about iterations. And I'd like to start with chapter one, iteration one, Liz as a student. Now I don't know if we sort of know this, but uh, uh, Liz is lucky enough to be joining the uh, professoriate with an old school friend of hers, uh, with Jane Venus. Um, and talking to Jane this morning, I asked her if there's any stories that she wanted to share, and she said, no, best if we don't, we'll keep a lot of those private. But Jane talked about uh, Liz actually going through nursing school with Jane's mother. So there was a, a lovely connection there between nursing and education that goes right back uh, to iteration one of um, uh, Liz as a student. I'm very aware also that I've only got five minutes for this. Uh, the bar is open for a certain period of time, so we have to get on with it. Iteration number two, Liz as a nurse, and that's, that's for Malcolm, he told me that because last time we sort of went a bit over time, didn't we Malcolm? Um, iteration number two, Liz as a nurse, Liz, the registered nurse, had many roles including nurse tutor, uh, in-service educator and postgraduate clinical care course coordinator, uh, clinical nurse specialising in intensive care nursing and a number of practice and leadership roles including 
uh, intensive care charge nurse, nursing supervisor and afternoon duty coordinator. So even from very early on in her career as a, as a nurse, uh, Liz accepted those challenges that were put before her of, um, of, of, of taking charge, of being in control. Sounds familiar. Iteration number three that I want to talk about is Liz as a mother. Uh, and Liz, to a mother of, of four children, that uh, I've, I've met a couple in previous uh, lifetimes that we've had together, uh, but met the, the final two today, so it's fantastic to meet um, the rest of your family, Liz. Uh, and to meet uh, two of the four grandchildren as well. Um, and for anyone that knows Liz, whenever we talk about the grandchildren, uh, you see that, that, that face light up. Uh, not so much with children. <laughs> <coughs> Iteration number four is Liz as a student, part two. So after being in nursing for a, a fair amount of time and recognising that she had a lot of skills that sat outside uh, clinical practice. Liz decided it was time to embark on a Bachelor of Commerce uh, and a Master's degree in Economics and in Management. Liz's Master's research explored nurses mentoring relationships and led on to her PhD, her doctoral thesis, which examined the effects of psychological sense of community on the level of job stress and burnout among New Zealand nurses. Now, I'm not going to reference any of this in an academic way, but I think Liz wrote most of this herself. I just pulled it straight off the uh, internet. I'm not getting graded, so it's okay. <clears throat> Which leads into um, Liz as an educator. Uh, iteration number five, Liz as an educator, part one. And this is where I first come in contact uh, with, with, as she was, Liz Hall back then and the management department at the University of Otago where she specialised in human resource management and organisational behaviour. And I owe quite a lot to, to Liz at this time because she was the, the person that gave me my first uh, quasi-academic role as a tutor in, um, in human resource management in one of her papers. And so that sort of started me off on, on the career track that I'm on now of uh, leading into uh, an academic life of standing around talking and now sort of trying to make some decisions. But it's interesting, uh, of course, Liz specialised in human resource management and after tutoring on one of her papers, I thought, no, nah, this isn't me, this is bullshit. <laughs> I didn't tell her that at the time, though. I wanted the grades. <coughs> but the other side of what she taught, that whole idea of organisational behaviour, why people do things within, in, within organisations, within institutions, that was the stuff that got me interested, particularly in the way that Liz taught that whole idea of organisational behaviour. Instead of controlling people, what, are, what motivates people? What do people need to get them moving to, forward to achieve their own goals and to reach uh, those places that they want to reach? So, iteration number six was Liz as a mentor. Liz has supervised 40 research projects, dissertations and thesis at, uh, at theses at honours and master's level in management, business and health disciplines. The research topics included uh, police stress, team performance systems, self-employment, uh, Māori women, female rugby players and family friendly workplaces. So she gave her time freely to many other people, many other aspiring young academics and researchers that wanted to once again attain their goals and reach the levels that they could. Iteration number seven was Liz as an academic. And as an author and academic reviewer with more than 70 research outputs, book chapters, articles, and international conference presentations, uh, published on a variety of business, education, and nursing topics. Um, Liz was a very prolific uh, um, um, author. Well, at least I think she is, because I, I had a look through some of her publications and see if you can pick a, uh, something interesting about the names she publishes under. <clears throat> and, of course, the um, Managing New Zealand Organisations, the first textbook that I picked up in a university context, uh, published one of the names was E. Hall. Burnout, Results of Empirical Study of New Zealand Nurses, L. Hall. <laughs> Using children's picture books for reflective learning in nurse education, uh, alongside uh, Josie Crawley and Sarah Walton, Al Ditzel. 
job stress among nurses, um, job stress among nurses, the implications for health care professions, EM Ditzel, an inquiry into good hospital governance, a New Zealand Czech comparison, E Ditzel, and sense of community among nurses, reality of a study, LM Ditzel. So there are six different pseudonyms actually published under two name a few. I haven't checked out the rest yet. Uh, and in 19, uh, sorry, in 2017, Liz was awarded a certificate of outstanding contribution in reviewing uh, by the Nurses Education Today Journal. <coughs> Iteration number eight that I want to talk about with Liz is that wonderful, caring, patient, empathetic, considerate, tolerant, understanding, gentle, tolerant. Oh, I think I said that, but I think it. it, it, uh, it, it it sits twice nicely. Uh, an individual with a heart of gold. And all of these things that I've just said here can be witnessed by any one of us in this room that have engaged with Liz over time. But I think I just need to say two words that will evidence and witness that for us all about what a wonderful person she is, a wonderful tolerant person. And those two words are, of course, Malcolm Lewis. <laughs> I met Malcolm at the same time as I met Liz uh, in the late 1990s and I look around this room here and there's a lot of the, the people from that same time period in this room which makes me really nervous. The people that I looked up to uh, over that time and, and people that I built great relationships um, and Malcolm and Liz uh, I consider to be very, very close friends and, and mentors of mine <coughs> which makes me very nervous. Iteration number, one, number nine is Liz as an educator part two. And Liz returned to nursing education in 2009. Her mantra or her, um, her focus in nursing education is she wanted her students to think like nurses, which harks back to all of those things that we've just talked about, the compassion, the caring, the dedication to cause, the helping other people, the consummate professional. She is involved in creative learning and teaching strategies and mixed reality technologies such as the HoloLens and was awarded a National Tertiary Teaching Excellence Award uh, by the Ministry of Education in Parliament in 2017. <coughs> she is involved in the Research and Postgraduate Committee here at Otago Polytech and in the uh, Internal Ethics Advisory Board to the School of Business and of course is Chair of Otago Polytechnic's Re Research Ethics Committee. Liz's story and all of these things that we've talked about here are stories of, of a wonderful person that gets things done through building relationships. And I think if we look around this room now, we can see the relationships at play for those people who have known Liz their entire lives, those people that um, met her through her journey, her nursing journey, her academic journey, the colleagues in this room uh, from both sides of the road but the friends that have come here. This story is one of relationships that are based on trust and on reciprocity. It's one of both concentric circles, with her being the centre, although I'm sure she wouldn't like to hear that, and her influence that goes out, but also of expanding ripples and the influence that she's had over every single one of us in this room here and our subsequent influence on others. I want to acknowledge the family, the friends, the colleagues, uh, the other members of the professoriate that are here tonight to uh, acknowledge Liz at this time. And I want to just finish with a small uh, whakatauki, a fire to ihi, a fire to iti kahurangi, strive for the treasures that you seek. And although I'm not sure if Liz set out to strive for those treasures, she's certainly shown that as a, a model for us all and has helped us to gain those treasures that we're all looking for. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce iteration number 10, <laughs> Professor Liz Ditzel. <laughs> Well, I think Ron has stolen some of my thunder. Whoops. Um, he's, he's found my secret. I have five alibis. <laughs> <laughs> 
cause, and I would recommend an academic never to change their name mid-degree or mid-career mid path. Um, some of those are accidental. I've called myself Liz. Sometimes the journal um, has said, what are your full names? And I have actually written my full name. So thank you, Ron, for the warm welcome. Thank you to Una. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I'm so thrilled to be here in front of you tonight. I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm going to, I know the drinks are over there. So um, Ron has stolen some of my thunder. I was going to introduce myself by way of the pathway I have taken through my career. I would like to say all of this education was free. And I'm so grateful for that free education. I paid one little bit towards the end of my PhD thesis because I'd taken seven years part-time, as well as having four children, as well as having multiple jobs to get the job done. So thank you, New Zealand government. I'm very grateful for free education. Um, it has, and I, I truly wish it was true for everybody to have that privilege that I've had through my, through my life. So I've taken every opportunity to get, a, get qualifications. Um, when I was looking at my qualifications, I found I had a degree in economics. I was quite amused by that because I thought I had a degree in management. Um, <laughs> there was some translation of degree papers that went through at one stage, and I had done more papers in economics than management, so I'm an economist, and that was quite a surprise to me. Right, I'm going to um, be aware of the time. This is the pathway. One of the things I discovered when I stepped out of the School of Business was this wonderful word called autoethnography auto and narrative research. And I love it because I can talk about me and my story and my journey, and Ron has already um, led into that nicely, so thank you. Kia ora, Ron. Okay, my professorial journey, I wanted this lecture to be on the 29th of October because it would have been the anniversary of my father's birth. My father arrived in New Zealand as a Dutch immigrant, post-war. He and his brother came, he was 21, his, father, his brother Art was 19. They arrived in Littleton with a brown suitcase, ice skates and no English. They were sent to the west coast where they worked on the railway. They built the railway line from Greymouth to Hokitika. And because they were Dutch, they finished early because they were hard working. Um, and on, so this is in honour of my father who died early from um, work-related toxins to his brain from working in a chemical treatment plant and he would have loved to have seen me standing here today because he really valued education. My brother, Abbott, was our scholar in the family. He had a PhD, had a scholarship to England and my father would have been proud of me today. Also my mum on the photograph here, this was on the occasion of my first wedding when I became Liz Hall. I married at 19, and here's my lovely mum and my lovely dad on that occasion. So my mother was a huge influence, as you will hear. So becoming a nurse. This is my mum, Judith Ditzel. She's the short one. <laughs> I'm the tall one. Um, we both, we had this product that came in the mail called Effect on, whoops, Effect on Gold. Whoops, sorry, Effect on Gold, which we lavished into our hair. So we looked like twin sisters for a while. Mum was a nurse who used to practice her skills at home. Everyone in the family had a boil lanced with a razor blade. I had my ears pierced with a surgical needle brought home from the hospital and they were always in the wrong places. My brother set fire to the kitchen and we had an emergency evacuation of the kitchen and we had burn, a burn treatment. So mum was an adventurous nurse and she treated animals and humans alike. So. That was my background as a nurse, and we had meals that were called blood and pus. That was rhubarb and custard. So, and a, a spider or an insect in the cauliflower was regarded as protein. So, mum was a huge influence on me almost not becoming a nurse, <laughs> although I stuck to it. Okay, here's me back in the early intake of nursing. Now, take a look at that photograph. Apart from me in the front row, what, what do you notice about what's happening in that photograph. There's lots of men, exactly. Um, eight, or t I think it was eight in our nursing class of 40 were men. They went on to do psychiatric nursing, general nursing and psychopedic nursing, which was care of the intellectually disabled. Um, we were a class of 40, eight of us graduated. Many of them went on to, be, to do different careers part way through their nursing training. We had a class reunion at 40 years post 
um, nursing and three sadly had deceased. So a nursing class, we, we live together, we work together and we perform nursing, nursing duties on each other in our nursing practice. Um, so this is our nursing class and as Jane mentioned her mother was a Tudor sister. The Tudor sisters are sitting at the very back but Jane's mother's photo is not in this image. Okay, this is um, Leslie Dennison, who's not here tonight, very kindly gave me my nursing council records at one of the study days I did at the hospital, like, this is your life, here's your file. And I picked all of this information out of that file. This was my nursing training. Over three years, I did 4,440 hours of clinical nursing in these areas or domains. There was a separate male nursing curriculum, um, they were allowed to do obstetric emergency and they were allowed to do genitourinary, misspelled there, nursing, um, so they were specialist domains. My nursing had a lot of obstetric or maternity nursing. I delivered 10 babies, 11 actually, one was an undiagnosed twin, um, during my nursing training. But 4,440 hours. My theory hours were quite different. <laughs> okay, these were the theory hours. And it's interesting, we've just had a curriculum review in the nursing school, and um, it would be interesting to see how these two things stack up years later. So the thing about the theory, and I looked at the differences here, I trained under what we now know as the apprenticeship worker model. I got paid. I got paid 50 bucks a fortnight, minus $16 for board. And that was a king's ransom. $34 would buy you a lot. You couldn't drink till you were 20. There were no cafes, you couldn't buy any clothes that, that were anywhere decent. The only thing you could buy was shoes that were imported. So we actually had money that we could save, which was hugely different to today. We had study blocks organised around body systems. I was sick with glandular fever when we did the urinary system, and I missed that whole week. No knowledge of the kidneys, sorry. <laughs> that never happened. Whoops, sorry. I'm going too fast here. Um, and our exams were quite brutal. If you failed, that was it, you went back a year. You had practical exams. If you failed, you had to do it again. Um, we had approved nursing tutors who followed us around the wards and who gave us our instruction. Compared to today, a very different model. Student-centred, learned-centred. Students pay to study with us. Our learning is organised into year groups, years one, two and three. We do have staircase learning. Our assessment system is different as well. It's very flexible, mainly internal. We give students opportunity to reset and pass special exams. The emphasis is on success. We want our students to be successful learners. And our state finals are two exams, multi-choice questions rather than the long essay questions. Our teachers, people like myself and members of the audience, registered nurses with postgraduate qualifications. We use whiteboards, computers, and a whole range of technology to teach. So it's a very different landscape. Um, I didn't actually count up the number of theory hours we have in our degree program, but I, I stopped at 2,000. I think it's quite a lot compared to our practice hours. But as a nursing school, we do more practical practice hours than others. So we do a great job working with our partners in the community. Something to think about. Where to from here? I don't know. But I might be part of that voice of the future as we change going through. So interesting to do that comparison when you're preparing a professorial lecture, looking back. Okay, this, this paper, this, and Sharon's not here tonight, sadly. Um, my friend Bess, who's in the audience, rang me and said, you're in the paper today. And I said, no, I'm not in the paper <laughs> at all. I haven't given an interview. I haven't done anything in the paper. This is my, me, the tall one, um, as a new staff nurse in the intensive care unit staff nurse Elizabeth Hall in those days, with our fancy technology. This was state-of-the-art technology. It was called a telephone that you actually picked up, and the machine beside it was called a printout machine, so someone could actually have an ECG in the country and print out an ECG, and we could say to them, well, this is a right-sided heart attack. You need to do this, you need to do that. Get in an ambulance, come and see us. So this was state-of-the-art technology, and it used to print about 12 feet of paper. And if you didn't have the paper in the machine, you didn't get a reading. And, and they couldn't do it again, so it was just tough luck. Our monitor screen was the green line that went across. Uh, and there's a few stethoscopes hanging in the background. 
It was a very frightening place to go. It wasn't where I wanted to go and work at all. Staff left quickly. There were four of us started on the same day. I was the only one left after three weeks. We didn't know what to do. Nobody taught us. It hadn't been really taught in our nursing curriculum. Emergencies happened. We had to learn on our feet. We had to ask questions. I collected a whole exercise book of rhythm strips, stuck it in my book, started writing things in it, and people said, hey, that's really interesting. Can we add stuff? Sure, this is our learning. We had procedures that were done out the back in emergency situations, no one really knew what to do or why they were doing it, same thing, we started to gather up the information. After about a year I'd been there, Sharon and I became the joint charge nurses um, because we had a staff that stayed, we had medical staff who wanted to come and work with us, and it was a, a place where people wanted to come because of the education that we had put together and because we looked after ourselves, we were a really big thing. Love the hat. I stood in front of the matron one day and said, I'm not wearing this anymore, and put it in the bin. She said, OK. And that was the last day we wore those. Um, there was no reason for wearing them that I could see, so we ditched it. OK. Being a registered nurse, um, a lot of people have influenced me in my life. And this young woman, Anne Crawford, she was 17 when she was admitted to the intensive care unit. She was a pupil at Columba College. She had pneumonia. She had... Um, not been admitted to hospital, not been seen very quickly, and the pneumonia was very severe. She ended up in the intensive care unit um, having, been, having to have emergency bronchoscopies, which is putting a tube down her throat, suctioning out usually a piece of lung that was sitting there waiting to come out, blocking an airway. And she was her, a heroic young woman at 17 who was there. She would make us line up outside the intensive care unit and she would pick one of us to look after her. We broke the rules for Anne. We let her brother come visit. It was a terribly, terribly bad thing to do because we weren't allowed to have under 16s visit in intensive care. We broke the rules for Anne. We had got her a television, a portable television. We broke lots of rules for Anne because we had empathy with her. We could relate to her. She was a heroic young woman and she was 17 and we were 21. And that was a really big learning, co learning curve. We worked together with Anne, for Anne, and we innovated. I remember telling her one day that if she didn't start breathing by herself, I'd design her a vacuum cleaner to wear on her back to, so she could, she could be ventilated and get around. And she was, oh, OK, I'll try harder to breathe. <laughs> it, she ended up having, she was the first New Zealand heart and lung transplant. And um, she was cared for on Linda Kinnebrough's ward, who's not here. Her photograph, her portrait rather, hangs. Oh, Linda is here. Oh, hi. I think Anne got a, a piano when she was in your ward. She did. Um, and there's a portrait of, hers, um, portrait of her hanging in Ward 7A, for those of you who have students working there. Um, Anne tragically died not long after she'd had a heart-lung transplant. But I learned a lot from Anne. I learned about humility, caring, compassion, and how to manage a team of nurses. Um, it was, she had her favourites, and we had to spread the favourites around because she was quite demanding at times. So Anne Crawford is one of my... Um, and when she left the intensive care unit, she turned to us and she said, I'm going to write a book about you. <laughs> her vocal cords had been so severely damaged by the, larynge, by the trauma that she'd had, she couldn't speak very well. But I can remember her going out in the wheelchair, turning and saying that to me. And I said, I did have a copy, but unfortunately I loaned it to someone who hasn't come back. OK, this is another photo from my early days, a nursing manager. My daughter Elena, sitting in the front row, was six weeks old in the doctor's bedroom when I went back to work. This was the opening of the new intensive care unit at Dunedin, the state of art. 5A, as it was then, 1981. Brand spanking new. 16 beds, wonderful. I don't know what happened to it over the over 40 years, but it certainly certainly went downhill pretty quickly in resources and staff. Um, thankfully, there's now a new ICU. OK, I'd been to England in the meantime, and I'd done an ICU course, and um, we had established the paperwork to get that running, so I taught one of, taught one of the first ICU courses, Janet also here tonight, um, followed behind me teaching on those courses. Right, we get to the management bit now. Okay, 
I went to the university to study management to find out what it was all about and I ended up writing a book about it. <laughs> and I went back to the book and I thought, where's some quotes about management? And I went to chapter two of the textbook that we'd written, co-written with colleagues, and here's, here's sort of three definitions all saying the same thing. It's about getting things done through people. It's really that simple. There's management fads and fashions. There's different things that we do, but essentially, if you're a manager, you've got to get things done through people to achieve organisational resources. It's as simple as that. So I went off to university to learn about this thing called management, and I found I had buckets full of experience that I could give back to students and tell them about my experience as a manager. So that's management for you. Managing an ICU. People at university said to me, oh, but you're a nurse. What do you know about management? And I said, heaps, actually. <laughs> um, so in the new ICU, we had 55 staff coming to work together. We had the cardiac surgical nurses who were rather posh, and we had the rest of us who just got on with the job. They had their rules and procedures and routines and protocols, we had ours, and we had to merge all of that together. Um, 55 staff to manage, that was quite a lot. Um, we need a new duty roster system. They complained to me they didn't like their shifts. I said, do it yourself. Here's a roster, go away and do it. And they did it. They said, this observation chart's not good enough. It doesn't do all the things we need. I said, two days, go away and do it, bring it back to me. We had the new observation chart still used in the Dunedin Hospital. Um, so it was a busy job getting all the paperwork done. I had a young baby, I was pregnant with my second child, and work just rolled on. I was quite interested to find this, a job description of a charge nurse. Salary, 10,300 plus 365 government wage order. Now, we bought our first house, it cost 60 grand. You could, you could by get a mortgage, the maximum you could get was 30. That was the maximum the banks would lend you. So my salary was a house, well, a house, what am I trying to say? A house was six times the salary. That wouldn't work today, would it? Maybe not even in Dunedin. So nurses, and here's a list of things that nurses did. Planning, leading, organising, controlling, management, all management functions. Okay, one of the other people who really influenced me, and I use John as an example when students tell me they can't write a 1500 word essay. John was admitted in August 1984. I was pregnant with, with Andy, my third child, and um, he was in the under 19 rugby team, and he dislocated his spine and went on to become a tetraplegic paralysed from the neck down. Um, I stayed with John until 2am that morning waiting for his parents to arrive. I held his hand, I made sure that the sedatives he'd had, I was there as a mother and a carer and he was our first ventilated tracheotomy patient to go home in the community thanks to the nurses who worked there in the unit at that time. Um, we did things with John. I learned about empathy. I learned about resilience, respect, courage from John. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, we took John down to the Burns unit. We put him in the bath. He had a tracheostomy. He was paralysed from the neck down. We put him in the sling. We bathed him. You know, we thought that was a great idea. We put him in a wheelchair and take him outside so he gets fresh air on his skin. We thought that was a great idea. He went to Janet's Halloween party. He went to a concert with um, another group of nurses. <laughs> um, and he eventually went home, and sadly he died um, a couple of years ago. We went to his 40th birthday party. He wrote with a voice-activated head-controlled mouse an 11,000-word assignment, a master's thesis. That is true courage. Um, and he had a major influence on my life. We had another a guy... Um, John Trevor at the same time, so there was the nurses actually worked together to make that work. Right, being a teacher, this is what Ron hasn't told you. My very first teaching job was as a music teacher. I was a violinist, a very bad violinist, but I did make it through to grade five. <laughs> and I was given a job teaching in a holiday orchestra program, and I did that job for two years running. I continued playing my violin right through my first year of nursing. And I knew I'd had too much when I fell asleep in the orchestra pit during the Mikado, the Nelson Operatic Society. I thought, I can't keep doing this, so I gave up playing. So being a teacher, my first job was twinkle, twinkle, little star, um, with, with very, very bad violin, 
violinists, and I've had other teaching educator roles that Ron has mentioned to you. The only one I had formal qualifications were was for my nursing tutor job. I was sent to Teachers College along with others, and we did 150 hours of teacher training. Um, so we had a certificate for teacher training. All the other jobs have been seren serendipitous. I've all just come across these jobs. My university lecturing job began when the lecturer, sadly, tragically died in front of the class. And my head of school came and said, oh, you teach nursing, don't you? Do you think you could go and take his lecture for us on Thursday? We'll all be at the funeral. And I said, oh, what's it about? They said, well, it's about critical path analysis, production scheduling. And I said, well, what, what have you got? And they said, he said, oh, I've got a, a blueprint of the Clyde Print Dam. I've got notes on the desk. And I said, oh, no problem. I'll go and do it. So off I went, 300 students, production scheduling management. And he said, well, no one complained. Would you like to finish the series? So <laughs> that's how I began as a university lecturer. It just all happened. OK. One day, and Maxine is here tonight, I had to put together my teaching philosophy and I thought, what is my philosophy of practice? And here's a representation of, of how I see myself as a teacher. I see myself as a mentor, a role model. I value experiential learning. I love reflective learning through stories. Um, anything that can help people understand. And in my teaching practice, I have had weird and wonderful assignments. Those of my colleagues here tonight from the management department will, might remember some of the large assignments that came to the reception desk, some of the collages, models, um, things that were dropped off. And this is an example of an assignment that came with a large cutout doll um, as well. And a group of students in a flat who were unable to get their work done, I said, OK, give me, give me what you can do. And it turned out to be a radio talkback show that they'd done in their bedroom with five students, and they taped it. And I said, that's fine, that'll pass. OK, a more formal work um, with my colleagues in the nursing school. Whoops. <laughs> colleagues in the nursing school designing our learning programs, um, putting it all together for our students. And this, we got an ARCO research grant to do this. The bit that I thought was the most interesting was the lab experiments, where students could could do spirometry experiments on themselves and record their heart rate. That was a bit they didn't like. They weren't very interested in that. And I thought, well, that's a bit surprising. That's a bit I would actually find the most useful. So we have had been running um, immersive learning through simulation in the School of Nursing, and we now have a very integrated teaching program. And thank you to my colleagues who work, have worked on that. Ah, the teaching innovation. Now, this, I owe this to my husband, Malcolm. Um, these wooden boxes. These wooden boxes have been around the world, literally. I use them to get people to think about what's inside the box without, first of all, touching it or listening to it. And that really frustrates them because there's this thing in front of them and the first they want to do is to touch it. That's all they want to do because that's what they think they should do. But I make them sit there for 30 minutes looking at it, thinking what could be in it and wondering why. And then, thanks to my colleague Josie, um, we were having a conversation one day about children's picture books, and I said, I'm really interested in that. So I add a story, a children's story about what's in the box to it, and I ask them to think differently again about what could be in the box to unlock their imagination. And all of this happens over about 30 or 40 minutes, and the time you get to this part, they've forgotten about wanting to touch the box or listen to it, because they're actually thinking. They've actually stopped to think the other rule is no cell phones. Turn them off, put them away. You've got to sit there and think and engage. So um, that's been one of my little, my little teaching programs. Teaching challenges. Um, working in China, I went to China to teach on an MBA program. I arrived and I had a keyboard with characters. I thought, oh, what's this? <laughs> I had to get someone to um, put some sticky things on, you know, so I could operate the keyboard. I was regarded as an expert in China. People wanted to talk to me. They got me to do to appear on the local TV channel. And I thought, oh, this really isn't who I am. Um, and communication barriers were quite, were quite challenging. But we, I designed some activities so that they got that, they could do the activities and become successful learners. We also had singing of nursery rhymes in class when things got a bit quiet. 
um, I'd been asked to go and talk to a children's preschool and I thought, what am I going to do? I'll do some nursery rhymes. So I practiced it with my MBA students and they thought it was very funny and it kept them awake. Learning te reo, thank you, Rom. It's been the biggest challenge in my life and I still can't get it right. <laughs> my, my brain has to work differently with te reo, but I have, I have tried really hard. I was going to do a little sentence, but I've lost it. I have forgot to write it down. Just okay, teaching rewards. Um, Ron has mentioned I won a National Tertiary Teaching Excellence Award, went to Parliament. Malcolm wore his long trousers for that event. <laughs> Those who know Malcolm, he wears his shorts. And um, at our nursing reunion, I remembered this note a little boy had written us um, that Nurse Ditz or Nurse Dalkey are not the best nurses ever. Um, but they have a good sense of humour, and he signed it, and I kept that for a long time. I eventually threw it out. But that is true praise from a seven-year-old, isn't it? You're not the best nurses, but you're quite attractive, and you have a good sense of humour. I really like that. It's good feedback from the students. Okay, becoming a researcher. I was a reluctant researcher. I didn't really um, want to do research, like most nurses, when they start. My research has all been driven by curiosity or need. And my first research project was in England and I, I watched people coming to the intensive care unit and think and seeing them struggle. And I wanted to do something to help them. So I designed a, a visitor's waiting room, gave it to the the building people, they built it and that was that happened while I was there. Um, the group shown here, they're my girls. They're the girls, they're the nurses. We gang, we're the gang who worked in the intensive care unit together. And I wrote about them. I got that published in As Dits or Al. <laughs> and it was part of my thesis report. OK, so the most fun piece of research was the mushroom case study with a couple of students of ours. They used to sell mushrooms down at the market, and um, they became our students. And um, I said to them, hey, your story's really interesting. Can we follow up on it and write a case study? And they said, oh, if you want to. So I worked with Dave and... Sam, Dave and Sam, and wrote their case study and I said, look, I can get this published in a book and it might get some money for you. They said, oh, cool. So I got a $250 royalty check, Australian dollars, and took it down to the market, cashed it, took it down and said, here guys, this is for your, this is for your case study. So that was, that was them. Um, they haven't sold any more mushrooms since then, by the way. And the most proud is my PhD thesis. It was a long journey and I worked really hard and I got there in the end. And I put this in, and I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> and I'm looking at the time, thinking, oh, I've still got time, right. Um, when I studied burnout, it was this whole, whole thing. It was a name people gave to a, a condition, and we all kind of knew what it was, and I had to go and define it. So I had to do, I, I read 270 articles. My literature review was 270 articles. I tried to find out what, what the things were were stressful, what the things were that could support people and what individual characteristics might be um, related to burnout. And then I constructed my theory because PhD work has to be something new. So I borrowed a concept from psychology and looked at the psychological sense of community and I thought, okay, that kind of looks like social support, but it's not. I can operationalise this. I can put a measurement on it and I can actually look at my research and I can see you all glazing over which is what I wanted because research is boring like this. Okay, this is my job stress and land and job stress um, map and some of the things I thought about in constructing my thesis. What about where you work? What about the type of work? It doesn't matter if you're male or female, it doesn't matter how long you've been in your job. Will this sense of community help protect you against stress? Will it stop you from burning out? And yes it did. <coughs> My research showed that yes, a sense of community was protective against burnout. My research showed that the youngest nurses were the most burnt out, most stressed, and the oldest nurses, plus 60, were the least stressed and least burnt out. No real big surprises there, but um, that's what I found at the end of a very long PhD journal um, journey in, in a nutshell. I did publish from it, and this may interest some of you here tonight, Emotional, the EE -E column is the emotional, emotional exhaustion indicator of burnout and A&E or ED is the one where burnout levels highest. 
Um, medical nursing, the NSS on the end, medical nursing is one of the highest stress levels in nursing. If you look down to rank seven, ICU is lower than the other fields. And that, that supported my theory about the sense of community. We were a group who supported each other, who looked after each other, who nurtured each other, who had parties together. Um, we were a group who had a very good sense of community, whereas A&E or ED nurses tend to be very much on the button, very much get the job done, very much respond, respond, respond. And if you look at the pattern of work that A&E or ED nurses do, it doesn't have that same sense of community or enrichment in your work or autonomy. So I'm going to move on from there. Um, my most scholarly piece of work was a great analysis of women's employment in New Zealand. And I reread the abstract, nothing has changed since I wrote this paper. Women are mainly in part-time work. Māori women are disadvantaged in their working opportunities, so we haven't gone far. But this was a very scholarly, well-researched piece that um, got faxed to a publisher. Do you remember fax machines? It actually went as a fax. Um, now we do it electronically, or and, it, and we used to actually print a paper out with a CD with it. So that was a, I was quite proud of that one. And the most intellectually challenging is one I did with Pavel, his photographs on the right. Pavel was a Czech, came from Czech Republic. He came to study with a colleague in the audience. And his field of knowledge was, was knowledge management. And I said to Pavel one day, what's this thing called knowledge management? He said, well, information management is a bus timetable. Knowledge management is knowing how to catch the bus. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. Good on you, Pavel. I understand that. We wrote this paper, it had five iterations. He said to me, let's compare the Czech Republic with New Zealand. I said, oh, I can't do that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not possible. Um, we, but we did, we kept doing it and doing it and doing it. We talked to conferences and the, in the end I said, There's, I've got a governance framework, why don't we use that and we can compare and contrast and we've got a model. And it, that was the one that got published into a, a textbook. So that was the most intellectually challenging because I didn't think we could do it, and we did. Okay, the new frontiers. Right, this is uh, my colleague Emma and myself, and I might, <laughs> I might need some audio help here how to make the sound go. Oh, here we go. Um, we are working with holograms now. Blue lips, okay. So what, what does it mean when someone has got blue lips? Not enough oxygen? Yeah, do, you, do we know what that's called when someone's got blue lips? What do we call it? A cyanotic? Cyanose? Yeah. And why do someone's lips go blue when they don't have enough oxygen? Oh, <laughs> sorry. This is a very, very, very delicate. Ah, oh. sorry, there we go, we've finished. No, we haven't. <laughs> okay, um, this is the hologram. So what you see in the classroom, you see wearing a headset and you see a patient sitting there and you can hear them. And this is one of our new teaching tools for simulation. So Sandra is the patient sitting, sitting there and you can see her vital signs in Emma in the classroom here has, and myself and others have been using holograms as simulators. And um, so this is a new face of nursing education. For those of you who thought role plays were really cool, this is kind of cool and better. Um, okay, so I now need to move on. Right, the, the image on your um, pamphlet here is of me working in a classroom with one of our holograms. He's called Jerry. And you'll notice something on his back. It's a large wound. And this is a cue that our nurses often miss because it's on his back. They look at the patient, whoops, patient from the front, and they don't think to go around the back. So we had a, a student, we had one group of our students who did not look at his back, and there was a lovely little film clip moment where Emma asked them to go and look at the back. And they said something really interesting, which I won't repeat. <laughs> but the hologram is a really useful tool, teaching tool because it is a 360-degree um, image. 
you can interact with them. They're surprisingly real, and it's a new way of learning. Okay, I just need to put that in. Right, so I'm rushing to the end because I know drinks are nigh. <laughs> Help along the way. The people who've helped me, my husband, Malcolm. He's been there as chauffeur, coffee maker. My first husband, Jeff, also helped me become an academic by providing me with the opportunities to proofread his books, to help write his articles, to read case notes and write them up and prioritise them. So I learned a lot of academic skills in those very early days. So that's an acknowledgement there as well. My family. Sitting in the front row, my four children and my, my sister and Lauren and Andy and Felicity over, the, over there with my two lovely little grandbabies um, who've come from Australia. They're really important to me. Uh, my mentors, Leonie, you're particularly important to me, and Maxine, you're particularly important to me as well, and others in the audience, Nina, my next door neighbour. <laughs> Um, all very, very important to me, my colleagues in the School of Nursing, many of whom are here today. Um, my office buddy, Josie, and I, we have, we have lots of chats. Our friends, my friends, book group ladies are here tonight, and um, my students as well. I always say hello to my students. I want them to be my friends. So I have a wide network of, of friends and acquaintances, and this is a family photo taken when my mum was 70 to acknowledge um, my brother who's not here, my two brothers who are not here, Mandy um, and Katie, my niece and Sam at the back. So there are some, and my uncle Art who's still alive, uh, my dad's brother. So that's a family group from the olden days. So to conclude, um, you will have heard me reflect through the journey. It's underpinned everything I do. I'm always curious. Knowledge is built through curiosity and I'm actively engaged in my learning and teaching. I hate it when I get bored. That is terrible. One size does not fit all. Through my nursing um, practice, I've broken rules lots of times um, to, in order to achieve something that I think is worthwhile. Management gives us this formal structure to get things done. It's a really important tool. Okay, It's really important. It underpins everything nurses do. We could teach managers a few things. Nursing has been a hierarchical organisation for years. Florence Nightingale did it first. And I think nursing education has an exciting future, technology included. <laughs> OK, so I do have some references there. Um, I do need to acknowledge the Otago Daily Times, the things I've cut out of the Otago Daily Times um, over the years. And I'm an excellent record keeper. That's why I've got this information. So don't ever throw things out. Keep things that you think you might need one day because who knows, you might become, <laughs> you might find a use for them. <laughs> well, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa, thank you very much for being part of my professorial lecture. Thank you, friends, family, for coming. Um, it's been a great experience being here today, and I'm really thirsty. <laughs> thank you. I'll introduce Janet Hewson. Janet was my mentor and friend, and still is, <laughs> and a neighbour. Yes, okay. Yeah. okay. Hello. This is um, called Liz, my first boss in New Zealand. It was February 1981, and Dunedin Hospital had just been commissioned. It was state of the art. It was the most perfect public hospital in the southern hemisphere actually at that time and look what's where we are now. We're doing a rebuild. Go figure. Anyway, I had an interview with a matron who was Margaret Duke at that time, if anybody remembers Margaret. Uh, she was very impressed with my resume. I gave her a, a piece of paper that had all the things I did on it. And she says, oh, intensive care experience. Oh yeah, we could probably use you with that. Uh, let's get you a work permit when that was a whole different story again. Um, but she takes me up to 5A, which Liz has already referred to, and I was very impressed. And I met the supervisor, who was Liz. Now, from her CV, which I just 
uh, copied off. In 1981 to 1982, she was the nursing supervisor of the fifth floor, which burns intensive care and surgery. And it said there that she was responsible for management and coordination of all nursing services performed on the floor. And it was a big job. And I was impressed. And she was at the point, at that time, she was doing the roster. Well, here I had an immediate problem. Um, I had to ask her, my supervisor, who was younger than I was, um, for a specific day off, and I hadn't even started work yet. It was unheard of where I came from in the States. I mean, you just didn't ask for things like that. But she was very casual, and she said, oh, we'll just put it down as a personal day. I'm going, what? A personal day? When I got home, I called somebody in the States and said, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> but like everything with Liz, she was casual, she was composed, very sure of herself, unflappable, decisive, and definitely in charge. And get this, she was pregnant with Elena. The medical staff looked at her when she spoke. They deliberately asked her for advice. They went to her when they needed help. And she had everybody's attention. So that was the beginning of my relationship with Liz. And by the way, four months later, or actually two months later, I think, I had her job. And it was the beginning of my wonderful career in nursing in New Zealand. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> we kept in touch um, over the next many years. Liz and I ended up living on the same street. Um, she had four children while she's on Moana Crescent, and I'm still living in the same house. I paid 28000 for it. <laughs> it was just valued at 540000 I mean, the world has gone crazy. Liz has moved. Um, anyway, this is what I remember about her career in nursing. I ran into Liz shortly after her fourth child was born, and she looked very, very tired. And I thought, oh, poor girl, this is it for you. Then I ran into her not that long later. She looked like she's ready to run a marathon. That's what she's like. She just keeps moving forward, taking greater challenges, and exceeding to the max. Despite obstacles, which I would consider four children obstacles, she figures out how to reinvent herself. Look at what she's accomplished. Have you read her CV? I mean, I, I was exhausted reading it. She puts her hand up, steps up to the plate. She has lots of confidence. When Liz went to the university to study and lecture in management, we, we still showed up at the same places. I was running the new grad program at the hospital, and I was running preceptor um, classes, training them up. I recall asking Liz to come, and she did. And, and unlike, um, Everybody else, she didn't just talk, she made them perform. Um, I can still see her picture, picture her working in the room, you know, going and helping the preceptors to um, toil through the exercises that she had given them. She was very unique in that way. I was talking to a colleague recently who started out in intensive care and she worked her way up and over and through all the uh, nursing structure and education and leadership and she said, that it had not been for Liz, pushing her to step out of her comfort zone, challenging her to take on new roles and new tasks, that she would not have gotten where she did. And I believe this. A good mentor like Liz progresses development that may never have happened otherwise. Because remember, all of us has the power to literally influence the attitude and the entire career plans of others by our actions and our advice. Liz understood the value of mentoring Mentoring never dates, so much so she wrote her 1993 thesis asking nurses about their mentoring experiences. And I was one of those participants. What a fun and nostalgic thing to do. Without a doubt, my earliest days as a new graduate with my mentor made me what I became as a nurse, leader, and educator for the 45 years, you know, next 45 years that I worked. Thank you, Liz, for the opportunity to reminisce and to reflect and to renew what my mentor meant to me in my career. And I'm sure all the other participants would feel the same. Another thought about Liz and her writings, in 2008, her postgrad uh, work about burnout, which has been mentioned, was of interest to me. Because several years before that, the DHB invited a nursing scholar out. Her name was Dorothy Del Bueno. If anybody remembers, she was a, quite a charismatic woman that strutted around the lecture theaters in high heels. I mean, but she talked about two things, the appliance nurse, you know, the one that just worked to get the washing machine. And um, she talked about, she says, you know, she didn't feel that nurses burned out so much as they were bored out. And she, re, she coined the term wor, um, work excitement. And I. Um, use that a lot in some of my teaching later on. 
But as Liz noted in her research on burnout, the sense of community was very important to nurses, absolutely. And I have always felt that exciting work is also important. Nursing is hard, is a hard profession. Back then, and it still is now, crappy hours, busy workloads, demanding politicians, the worried public. But despite that, nurses who feel camaraderie with their colleagues keep coming to work every day and work that is exciting, not tedious or boring, which is why ICU nurses probably, you know, come into that better category. It makes the work worthwhile and interesting, and nurses do not become sick of it. Liz believed this as well. In her bio, she says, intensive care nursing required quick thinking and smart problem solving. I believe an early career in ICU nursing with a good mentor keeps you inspired and excited. Teaching nursing students and placing new grads with that in mind produces nurses who enjoy their work, stay in the game, support their workmates, feel excited, want to go to work each day, are not bored and rarely burnt. Liz's experience suggested that um, not only is burnout survivable, but in many cases it actually led to a positive um, rather than a negative change in both personal and working lives. It was with great relief that in 2009 she saw the light and she returned to the beginnings of her real interest, which was teaching nursing. She just didn't prepare and, and, and lecture. She actually got out there with her students, and I recall many conversations into your house over dinner and drinks and stuff, that your student placements were such an enjoyment for you, and you got um, the enjoyment you got for being back into that environment. Now today, there's an array of techno stuff, which has been mentioned. It's used in teaching nurses outside the clinical area. In my day, we had Annie and the head, which is the intubation you know, guy. Liz has been closely involved with this creative learning and teaching strategy at the Polytech, the high fidelity simulation mannequins, which is like Annie on drugs, you know, um, lab tutor, which I never heard of, and holographic patients, I love that. I have to mention that the cyanosis on the lips, what did, what, what did you deliberately see on that? Much more, you know, that means much more. Um, that's, don't get me into starting into people that just notice something as opposed to deliberately looking for something, but that, well, we're going to go there. But anyway, what a contrast to the beginning of the, uh, in the beginning when Liz mentioned the 1981-82 critical care course, which Liz was instrumental in getting off the ground, and it was the only one of its kind in New Zealand, and for decades thereafter, it was top of the shelf. We had, a real, we had real patients and real families and real situations at, in, in those days. We could, we could touch people and talk to people and treat them. This is an example of how Liz has moved with the times, embracing the technology that offers um, on offer to enable students to expose and practice in a world where you know, real stuff just isn't as available anymore. I did note that in 2014, she got that, uh, her and her team got that $10,000 research grant. Liz was the head researcher for this multi-team project that investigated the outcomes of immersive, I never heard that one, immersive learning using technology and simulation. This research has produced, can you believe it, four international articles, seven conference proceedings, and a national report. That's impressive. The study concluded that the immersive learning approach was effective, however, interesting, despite the high level of authenticity made by these fidelity ma mannequins, realism was very hard to um, uh, establish. An unexpected learning outcome, though, was when the technology malfunctioned, we pressed the button and it did nothing happened, the students had to use problem solving skills to figure it out. So that was very interesting. So her contribution to education, whether directly in nursing or elsewhere, is very noteworthy. I mean, I sort of just looked as I was um, just looking through all the things she's done. I mean, she's worked with the police, dental students, women in refuge, medical students, midwives, Pacific Islanders, Chinese business persons, chocolatiers, ice creamers, sports business persons, kid clothiers, and dishwasher makers. That's Fisher Pickle. As well, her professional influence is as a moderator, an examiner, and a supervisor, a journal reviewer, conference presenter, a publisher, and almost a member of the Otago District Health Board. Almost. 
It was with my pleasure I was able to con contribute a supporting um, letter for her 2017 National Tertiary Award that she got at Parliament, and that was a big deal. Well, that's about it because I'm thirsty. I'm really thirsty. And uh, well, I just want to say, hey, Liz, do you remember you promised to help me with external moderation for that course in Vanuatu? Yes, you do. Okay. And by the way, thanks for that day off in 1981. <laughs>